Best Podcast Ever is sponsored by the Gertzberg Law Firm, a full-service business law firm in Cleveland and Chagrin Falls that's changing the way businesses retain their attorneys. Go to GertzbergLaw.com to learn more. While you're there, check out Cover My Six, a complete legal audit of the six areas that most often create or prevent business lawsuits and government investigations. Go to CoverMySix.com to learn how we keep you safe. Enjoy the show. Stay tuned after the show for a legal tip from an attorney from the Gertzberg Law Firm. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to the best podcast ever recorded. I think the first thing is recognizing that process is actually sexy. Hi, Alex (laughs) Gertzberg. Hi, Molly Gebler. How's it going? All good. Dude, how goes it with you, man? I'm good. I'm so busy. I showed you. I didn't even get to tie my shoes today. Why are you so busy? busy I was. You know, we're setting up Holly Hall or Deck the Falls in the Township Hall. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised the Gertzberg Law Firm didn't do a a holiday tree. Um, Mm -hmm. What's the... so what our is, chamber members make right. a little mini tree. The, the good chamber members. We're obviously. On, we're on, obviously on the naughty list. 75 of, of the good chamber members. Um, and um, so they get, they all, they're each get silent a- auctioned. So they're all in the, so um, in the past, your hometown has done Deck the Falls. Mm-hmm. It used to be Holly Hall. Then there was a change of leadership, and it got changed to Deck the Falls. So it is in the Township Hall. They decorate it. It's so beautiful. And Santa comes comes on the weekends, and there's cookies and such. And now that your hometown stopped doing it, give Chagrin Valley, which is a local nonprofit, um, they said, well, we'll take it on. And then the chamber said, well, we'll take on the, the tree part because it's business-focused, um, you know, Give Chagrin is more um, family focused mm-hmm. and community focused and where the chamber is business and community. So we said we'll do the trees, um, which means just, you know, gathering them and having our chamber members decorate them. They're, they're amazing, amazing trees. Are there 75 trees in there? There are many trees. Yes. Got it. So yes. each. So you the silent auction and everybody bids on them for a week. You just pe- keep people keep popping in. I mean, there's trees there that there's one that's got these hand painted ornaments um, that are just. They bid on the tree. They bid on the mini tree, and then at to the take end they get them. to take it home. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that that money that is raised uh, goes to the visitor center staff to to fund the visitor visitor center, which is that desk out front. Mm-hmm. Correct. Correct. So, yeah, I didn't see a Gertzberg tree there. I'm sorry. sorry. I thought we had this unspoken rule where um, you would just count me in for stuff or <laughs> like if, if it was, you know what I mean? Like I, have I that, can't. I, I have that unspoken rule with all 583 members. Yeah. Um, that's why I send you all an email. Couple I, don't read, I, got, I don't read those emails. I thought you said mine go into a special little box. <laughs> all right, let's 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 move on. Um, yes. yes. So, Alex, we killed it. We did. In Columbus. We did. That was we awesome. We did. I Wasn't know. It seems like forever ago, but um, that was so great. We yeah. shared the essay contest. We went down to Columbus, Ohio to um, talk to a group of uh, school board members from around Ohio. And uh, uh-huh. we gave this... <laughs> we gave this... For the record, Molly, look, well, you're 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 doing your best to chew that kind bar without my lunch. I know, and I just think it's so cute how you're you're trying not to make noise with it. Um, so I had to tell. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I'm you. I don't think on they you. would have noticed. No, it's just too cute to pass up. Um, so anyway, so we gave this great talk with our good friends Nancy Santilli and Bob Hunt of the Kenston and Chagrin Falls School Districts, respectively. They are the superintendents Correct. there, and they invited us to speak, mm-hmm. and we did kill it. Yes. That was I mean, a lot we were of... accepted to speak. We you were. know, that was a process. They yeah. they, they recommended, it. and mm-hmm. then we got accepted. So. Yeah. yeah, that was us really good. Us and Gina Davis. Yeah. Listen here, Ohio School Board <laughs> Association. Don't put us opposite Gina Davis, Oscar-nominated actress Gina Davis. 
Don't put, I mean, come on, Ohio School Board Association. We would have had hundreds mm -hmm. of people in the audience instead of the fraction 22. 22 people. Yeah, we could, come on, OSBA. Um, but it was very cool mm -hmm. and it was an honor to be there and a huge thank you to Bob and Nancy yes. uh, for uh, for inviting us to speak class to your- Class acts. They are class or acts. class ass, whatever. Either way. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that was very fun. And then that I, before fun. that, I was in Maryland um, for a surprise baby shower mm -hmm. for my twins that are coming. <laughs> oh my goodness. Not my twins, everybody. My grandbaby how, twins. How far along is Sam? 21 weeks. What What's the gender? Boy and a girl. Okay. Uh, Mary and John. Mary and John. Mary and Johnny. Yeah. They already named Johnny. them? They um, named their fetuses? Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Get out of here. Is that yes. for real? It's I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't yes. know you did, you did that. That's great, Molly yes. Gabler. Yes. And then the other night, if I could just keep going, because I have so much to share. Um, the other night I went to uh, Cooper's Hawk, had their grand opening. Cooper's Hawk is a new restaurant. It's a winery across from Pinecrest in Orange. And oh, yeah. I am just going to have to tell you right now. Talk to me. There was nothing spared. And I do a lot of Red Ribbon, and it's not against any of the places that we have hosted Red Ribbons. But I will tell you what. They treated everyone there like kings and queens. The food never stopped. The open bar never stopped. They served a almond champagne Whoa. that was unbelievable i had to buy two bottles of it um, so when you walk in it's it's there's this humongous bar which is a tasting bar and it's not they have a whole nother bar this is a strictly so you go and you it'd be a fun um gertzberg escape day off thing a retreat yeah no like you're, you do your hooky oh, days because day. yeah. like you could just go there and just sample tons of wines um and just the food was hmm. It was outstanding. Cooper and then you Hawk. can buy beer or buy wine, like they have their, their wine. I tried a cranberry wine and a winter blend. Oh my gosh, so good. So good. Their 34th store, 34th restaurant, and mainly in Chicago. What kind of food? Everything. Everything, uh, you know, to a hamburger, to a lobster, anything. Well, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So welcome, Cooper Hawk. Welcome, Cooper's Hawk. And, Cooper's Hawk. Uh, Welcome to the cha welcome to the chamber. Welcome to the valley. And they're a chamber member they too. They are chamber members. Well, yeah. that's smart, Cooper's Hawk. You know, uh, you I want, think so. You don't want Molly on your bad side, right? This, right? this could have been a much different kind of in endorsement. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> As in none. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. Um, that's, um, good man. You know, yeah. So that was lovely, and I got to see our Rob Sapp directed Beechwood's um, Peter and the Star Catcher. Um, at Peter Peter, High who, School. Who wrote that? It Do was you know? the, pr I don't know who wrote it. It was the, it's the pre to Peter Pan. Oh, okay. So it was how that Peter guy. became Peter Pan. How did Peter become Peter Pan? Um, He got in the stardust, which makes you whatever Fly. you want to be forever. And Ooh. when he got into it, he didn't know that that was the power. And they said, well, you know, what do you want to be? And he said, I don't know. I just want to be a little boy for a while. And they said, well, when you're in the stardust, a while is a long time. And and then he became. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Is it? It's very interesting. It's yeah. a great, and it's a play. It's not a musical, uh, but it's a great way to, to find out, like it was Wendy's daughter. It was Molly, but Molly ended up being Wendy's mom. And then she had a nanny through this play who ended up being the dog. In Peter Ooh. Pan, so there were. It was, and when when he got his hand cut off by the shark or by the alligator, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that happened there. Oh, yeah, it was really good. It's kind it of. Really it good. kind of reminds me of like Wicked a little bit, right? Well, actually, that's Rob did explain that that is which Rob um, Sapp was in. Rob Sapp was in it, yes. Um, but he's doing in spring at Beach what he's going to do Fiddler. Is that right? Mm -hmm. He should talk to young Jacob Gertzberg yes. about that. Yes. Um, I was uh, telling the, that story. Yeah. Um, and Rob, if you need anyone to come in and teach the kids any Yiddish words, you let me know. I'll oh. Hook you up. I know some Yiddish. I bet you yeah. he would love that. Yeah, I'll hook him mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's so that's all I got for you. That's, that's all all I got. So what exciting. do you have for me? What did you do? Um. Well. Um. My baby girl and I had. Um, oh, you date have night. a girl? Yeah. Oh my. She's my baby. Oh, uh, I she's had a five. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> we had date night uh, on Saturday night. We went and saw the uh, Sugar and Valley Little Theater production of Little Mermaid. Oh, how was it? It was fantastic. It was fantastic. And the girl who played Ariel just killed it. Did a really good job. Just belted out the tune so nicely. Um, and we were right in the front row, which was great. Um, I, we enjoyed it very much. Um, I got to see, in, in to add to my amazing jam-packed weekend, I got mm-hmm. to see um, my little Maria, who's my she's the chamber's mascot. She was in a little dance recital. All right. And it, she's in first grade, but there were also then kindergartners yeah. there. And there was one girl who just, if if hands were up, Hers were down. If people were turning, there's she always was one sitting. Oh my there's gosh! One. To her own drum, <laughs> not not my brilliant Maria. Right, she she was spectacular. She was like the Rockettes. Correct, correct. In step. But this little one just <laughs> and and it's funny because she's watching the leader. Like you're thinking she's watching because she's trying. I think she's literally watching to see what she should not do. Like the like she oh she was adorable, hmm. loved it. Oh so go ahead. Anything else good? Um, no. Oh, you know what? Actually, we did do something that was fun yesterday out and about around town. There is a cafe in Ohio City, and it is filled with board games. Uh huh. Have you seen that place? I have. Have you been there? No, but it's so much fun. We've thought about doing that at Township Hall just one week, like a a winter night. Oh, just have everybody bring a board game. Yeah, and you could play each other's games. Yeah, um, this place is really really cool. (laughs) I love this move you're doing, Molly. (laughs) Molly is deliberately chewing away from the mic, ladies and gentlemen, and it's very cute. You know, I mean, everyone knows how tiny I am, and to to miss a meal would be <laughs> life threatening to me. Um, so we went to this place, and I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's on West Twenty Fifth Street, mm-hmm. and man, hundreds how and hundreds cute. and hundreds of board games. And so uh, we I went, we played, we played Battleship, we played. Ooh, have you ever played this game called Exploding Kittens? No, it's it's outstanding. It's it, it only takes like a minute to learn how to play, and then you're hooked. You're totally addicted. Huh. It's great. Exploding Kittens. We played that. But I did hear the Holly Hobby's coming out with a game. What's Holly Hobby? It was like a doll back in the 70s. If you saw her, she wore like a blue bonnet and a blue dress. I think if you saw her, you would and also recognize her. I was a girl in the 80s. I'd probably know more. <laughs> well, the chicks you were hanging out with probably had Holly Hobby. Um and uh well anyway we played a bunch of uh, board games there and that was a lot of fun. fun yeah it was cool and then we went to west side market which I, uh most of us okay. yeah most of us went um two of the three who kids. all went um you know my friend tiffany and i <laughs> drank <Drink. laughs> and uh does Ethan tiffany and... know about our new game um i can't remember if i told her about <laughs> it or not i think she would feel honored uh, a that her boyfriend's talking a lot about her, maybe, and B that you know she has her own game now. It's you know what uh, it, it's interesting about her. So she, you know she was in sales for like Ooh. fifty. Stop. <laughs> you know my friend, T money. <laughs> um, but she was in sales for like fifteen years, and then decided she hated sales, and then wanted to be a nutritionist. So, so she went back to school to finish some required undergrad coursework so that she could start a master's program and you know she's in her mid-30s and i'm watching her doing homework at home and i would put a gun in my mouth if i had to do as much homework as she's got and she's doing it every single day I, i i all right maybe not a gun in my mouth but i would be really upset um i don't think i could take it and uh just she's very diligent and um oh, good for her yeah, yeah and it's a lot it's a lot of of studying and a lot of work um, um speaking of a gun yes i i, I can't wait to see where this segue goes <laughs> i did shoot one for my for the first time ever talk talk about it let's talk and about it 
I don't want any phone calls or well, you're you know, a registered gun. It is your Second and, Amendment right, Molly. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But it seems to not be okay with some people. But um, that's why I didn't even post the picture on my Facebook because I it, didn't want to deal with it. Was it an assault rifle? No. All right. No, it was a handgun. I think most people are okay with, especially chamber okay executive hand- directors <laughs> owning handguns. I don't own it. Uh, it wasn't sure, mine. It's, it's fine. It was uh, just a... Uh, my my son in laws and we yeah. were out on their you know two hundred acre farm, mm. um, and they were testing out a gun. And he how said, did that feel, Molly? It was a Springfield XD Mod two point four zero caliber. So it was it was a, it was a handgun. It was a handgun. Interesting. Um, you know what? I have always wanted to, yeah. and I've had many police officers say. You know, let us know and we'll take you. And it just, the the moment presented itself mm-hmm. and I just took it and, uh, you know, I can check it off my list. Okay. I, I probably will not shoot again. Like it, it didn't fulfill anything for me. I just checked it off my list. Hmm. I checked off my list and... Um, I, I really enjoy uh, firing... Uh, weapons of any kind yeah. i think it's a really fun thing to do in the in the in the sense well first i mean if you are the type of person that believes in gun ownership for self-defense purposes it is something you definitely need to train in it ain't yes. something that you no. just get and pick up right. you need to train for a while yes but if you are a recreational gun owner and, and i am and i i think it's one of the funnest things to do and to get yeah. better at it is a skill and it has a force man yeah like it, it, it feels it good i mean jolted, it does jolted me i think it feels good to get better and better at accuracy yeah you i know trust me it, my bullet's still going my guy <laughs> <laughs> there, I did not hit anything. Is that right? I'm sure yeah. of it. I'm sure of it. But I'm sure yeah. it was a proud moment for my son-in-law, you know, giving his mother-in-law the, the or maybe not, maybe. Yeah. But he's a, he's a Marine, you know, right. I mean, I was, I was in good company, but the more that I think about it, like he really just handed me the gun. I mean, he gave me a, a couple quick he said, don't, tips. Don't point this at anyone, Molly. Exactly. <laughs> it's once I do this, it's yeah. you know, there's there's a there's a bullet in the chamber, yeah. and and this. The more that I think about it, you know, I really probably should have spent a little bit more time in the training. But you know, yeah. that's how I roll. That's how you I know roll, what's so. really fun is skeet shooting. You should do that sometime. Mm. Before you say, I probably won't shoot again. You know who does that a lot? I think. Um, is Dave Joyce. I think oh, really? He has like an event where you go and I think so. I think that's the kind yeah. that it is. Don't quote me on that. He just won re-election. He did. Shout yeah. out to... Yeah, congrats. Uh, congrats. Uh, hey, let's go shooting, Congressman. Yeah, uh, he uh, would love to. Let's go skeet shooting. Oh. So um, this is a first ever for the podcast today, our mean? guest. Is it? Well, yeah, How because so? he reached out to us to be oh. a guest. Oh, that's true. We've never had that. That's we true. ask well, continuously. I think I think the um the uh Like what, do you you didn't know him prior? No, no. I right. think the, the I think the the um important thing here is we asked you know, we asked our audience to send in suggestions and to reach out to us if they or someone they knew would be a cool guest. And uh, Ron Kaminsky uh, heard our call for guests and, and answered. So thank you, Ron. So cool. Yeah. I can't wait to talk to him. Um, Ron Kaminsky is a certified EOS implementer. He's got a company called Culture Shock, and he has a system within culture shock called the Buffalo concept, which I can't wait to talk to him about. I am a fan of the system that the EOS system that he trains companies in. Um, and I can't wait to talk to him about it. He basically helps businesses and business owners be more efficient and accomplish their goals. And I've heard a fair amount about EOS and I've actually started reading the book that spawned EOS, which is called traction, uh, Gino Whitman. And uh, I recommend it, but, uh, yeah. And then before that, he had, you've read this book that he goes out and trains like, like so many other books, Molly, I've started it 
and um, I have not gotten very far. Well, actually, I've read two books this month, Alex. That's not true. Is that well, true? Listen, I listened to two books, but you said right. it was the same thing. Yeah, it is. It counts. Okay, so Which, yes. What are the two books? Um, <laughs> now these are driving books. You know, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Rob Lowe, things I tell, <laughs> things I tell only, or things I only tell my friends, which was very yeah. good. And then Andy Cohen's most, or Andy Cohen's something or other. Um, I'm and noticing he just a trend. Spills the dish. Yeah. Oh, he spills it. Um. Go all ahead, right. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, so before. Uh, before his current company, he was the head of a company called Studio Think, which was all about high performance culture development. And Studio Think was a company that acquired a company that he started called Corporate Quest. So I think he was at Corporate Quest and then moved to Studio Think when Studio Think acquired it. I could have that totally wrong. I should really know what the heck I'm talking well, about. Well, maybe here, we should just wait yeah. until our yeah. guest comes and he can kind of. Yeah. Fill in the holes um, that you've right, created. Right, the, the giant mammoth holes that I've walked right into. Uh, anyway, let's get him in here. Hey, eh? All right. So, Ron, any relation to any Kaminsky's in Wycliffe? Uh, I don't think so, okay. although we're really good breeders. Okay. My father's one of ten, so oh, about forty first cousins on that side. Wow, wow, strong as well. that's an expensive okay. Christmas. I it think. is. We can't even meet in houses anymore. Right, right. You <laughs> got to rent out a hall. Uh, <laughs> so. Do you have lots of siblings? I have three younger sisters. Okay, I'm the oldest of four. All right. So yeah. he stopped at four, huh? He did. He's like, forget this. He's like, 10 is crazy. (laughs) Forget this. (laughs) See how stressed out my parents were. I too, Ron. We're we're almost soulmates. I too am a product of, oh no, you're a product of four. Well, I'm a product of 10 as well. Oh, wow. Yes. I'm a Brady Bunch family. I've got six step family and four of my own. So we were 10 growing up. There was 10 of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Was it really loud in your homes when you guys were growing up? I mean, I think yeah. any home was is it? loud unless well, you're an three younger child. sisters. Yeah. Yeah. What did your parents, both of you, what did your parents do for a living? Uh, so mom didn't work when. How could she? She had a full-time job. Right. So mom didn't work until I think I was in college. And then uh, dad worked uh, procurement for Avery Dennison and now Ingersoll ran. So. He's been an exec kind of all his life. Mm-hmm. My dad was a dentist. Dentist. Um, the reason I ask is because uh, raising 10 kids ain't cheap. Well, he, is, he comes <laughs> from imagine. a family of four. Yes, my his dad. dad is a family of 10. Right. I guess I should so, have asked what your grandpa yeah, does so for a living. My grandfather for a actually sold life insurance for Western and Southern. Oh, wow. So on commission, raised 10 kids. Wow. Mm. But see, so, it wasn't because they didn't have all the the shit we have today right so you know they he paid for the basics right and when they got a deal on bologna cable they ate bologna for a month right exactly right yeah spam um interesting yeah Yeah, well welcome ron we were (laughs) just saying that um it, that you are the a first for us. Oh, really? Yes, meaning that you're the first one to reach out and a, and want to be a guest, and you we're so excited. Call. You answered awesome. our plea. Yeah, yeah. So we're so excited to have you. Basically, we have to beg and pay people, but <laughs> well, you can still. Wait, pay we didn't me. tell Rod. You don't want to know what Molly Rob's has to do <laughs> to get to get our guests to come over. I want it noted that we. It's been twenty minutes, and and. Alex has taken it to another level. That's what you right always say guy. when I take it I know, to another level. I know. So and, and I had to call you. I, I would like to. I'd also noted that it usually takes Molly only nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, oh, Ron, yes. welcome, so, Ron. Yeah, um, Thank you. I have a story to tell you. So you know about um, Dan Sullivan and Strategic Coach. I do. Yeah. yeah. So I've been in that for a couple of years. Oh, this is great. my third year, and. Every session, so that's this coach thing that I go to in Chicago, Mm -hmm. Molly, right? So um, every session that I go to over there, there's always someone who is an EOS instructor. Yeah. Right? And so, Molly, I was 
talking about the yeah. book traction, right, right? That kind of started the whole EOS thing, right. right? Which we'll talk about in a second. Sure. But Gino Whitman was a strategic coach guy, apparently. From, he still is. Still is. In fact, right. I think he's been in 17 years. Okay, right. Yeah. That's that right, right, right. So um I think the two organizations work well together Mm -hmm. and there are a lot of there's a lot of crossover and so at strategic coach we have our home office right where we go to you know four times a year sure but if you miss your session you can go to any other one okay that's that same session so there's always people floating in and out and invariably there is an eos guy who comes in that missed his session and is there (laughs) This happens every single time. The new guy who is an EOS guy um, says that he's an EOS guy and talks about how he helps companies be more efficient and accomplish their goals and all that stuff, right? Sure. And then somebody else will say, hey, I just got my own EOS implementer and it's great. And the two systems, the strategic coach system and the EOS system work really well together. And before you know it, it turns into an EOS discussion that sure. we have to cut off so that we can focus on strategic coach instead. And that has happened every single time. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I thought you would get a kick out Very of that. Cool. You're not in strategic coach, are you? Not yet. Although okay. they keep calling. So yeah. I'm thinking they, about it. Yeah. So now that I've said uh, much all that too much about EOS, <laughs> why don't you tell us, Ron, what EOS is and what you do with it? Meaning you, yeah, Ron Kaminsky. Sure. Yeah, so um, I think actually Dan Sullivan, I think, says it the best. He says, you know, his strategic coach experience, he kind of calls it the operating system for the entrepreneur. Yeah. And EOS is really the operating system for their business. And so every business has an operating system. So it's Alex OS or Ron OS or whatever we're running on. And we may just be throwing that together, you know, pieces, parts. EOS is meant to be a holistic operating system to help companies do three things, vision, traction, and healthy. And, you know, how do you get everyone aligned and rowing in the exact same direction on one common vision? How do you get everyone set up in a culture of disciplined execution and accountability against that vision from a traction standpoint? And how do you keep them healthy? You know, so goes the health of the leadership team, so goes the health of that whole organization. And so we think we do those things really well inside of EOS. And uh, I actually came to EOS as a client first. Hmm. So we implemented EOS as an operating system at Culture Shock, and it literally changed my business. So and Culture Shock is your business. Correct. And on a side hustle you are a <laughs> side, hustle. <laughs> side hustle yeah that's what you call it so eos is one of our two offerings inside of culture shock so oh, okay uh, okay so uh myself and another implementer kimberly dyer are implementers at e- and culture shock we both specialize in eos uh, and the rest of our team helps companies compete on culture and so we do team building events all over the country mostly with a give back component uh charity component uh, but we also help companies measure and then influence their scores from a culture health standpoint in their organizations to better attract and retain A players. When you say scores, is that something that you guys have come up with or something that Gina Whitman has come up with? Or? Yeah, no, it's outside of EOS. It's it's actually uh, – so we started self-measuring. We created a culture health index Alex internally. does that all the time. And, uh, and, and so – we felt our Shit, clients right. actually wanted to <laughs> wanted to. I know um, that that, that joke had to sink in. It got <laughs> funnier <laughs> as it as it went. You good. distracted our guest. He couldn't I, even I finish lost his my set. train of thought. Oh, I know. It's what I do. It's a nice oh, visual. That was good. Um, so uh, yeah, so as opposed to self measuring, we actually brought on a third party tool to help us measure culture health and whether or not we're having an impact and, and moving that needle. Can you? Just for people who might not understand, for our listeners, what is culture? I mean, obviously, I know what that means, but what what are you talking about when you say that? If if to make sure a business is culture. Yeah. So if you really think about culture, uh, it's kind of like brand. You're right. 
brand is the conversation people I think are having about you outside of your organization. Well, culture is the conversation people are having internally about your organization. Gotcha. I was and, thinking something totally different. So I'm glad I asked. So you said that um, Culture Shock really has two offerings. One is EOS and one is this culture piece with that comes with this measuring tool, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And, and do, do those two services um, generally work together or does somebody get one or the other? Yeah, you know, EOS is actually built for companies about 10 to 250 people, privately held organizations, entrepreneurial spirit in that leadership team. When we get involved in Compete on Culture, we're working with the larger organizations, maybe the key banks or the hmm. Bank of America's, Kro Kroger's, et cetera. So those organizations tend to be a lot larger and more matrix. EOS is a really set up to help those organizations. They're a little bit too matrix for us. Um, and so we do, we do have offerings that can help them, but I think it's a little outside of that EOS framework. Culture Shock is for the bigger companies. EOS is for the smaller companies. Yeah, Compete on Culture is for the larger organizations. Compete on Culture. However, culture. we do have plenty of small to mid-sized businesses that leverage us to help them through yeah. team building, measuring culture, et cetera. So there is some cross-pollination yeah. there. And the – well, let me let, – let's step back. Um, what do you think holds – businesses and business owners back what, what's the what are the biggest obstacles that you've seen consistently business owners hitting you know hitting a yeah. wall with yeah so we, we we think businesses hit ceilings for about five reasons number one is as they not joining their local chamber of commerce sure that's obviously that won't being one of them of course right so you really have six now probably. six <laughs> six reasons why businesses hit ceilings but first is they just get too complex as they scale and so the message and the structure and our processes just get more complex than they need to be second is you get these entrepreneurs that just continue to be the bottleneck in their company and they just hold on tight, they have a hard job of letting go of the vine and delegating down into their teams. Um, so we really help them solve their people issues so that they can delegate to people that really get it, want it, and have capacity to do it. We think companies hit ceilings because they're not doing a great job of predicting their business, so they constantly set these goals that might be unrealistic. Um, and so we set ourselves up for kind of a muscle memory of continuing to miss numbers, and that hurts confidence in the team. And then I think we have companies that just aren't well documented from a systems or process standpoint, and everyone's just kind of trying to do it their own way, which adds complexity and causes them to hit ceilings. And then, and then they're, they're potentially not structured correctly. So we try to help organizations kind of with all five and now six of those right. uh, yeah. reasons for hitting the ceiling. Yeah. But, but uh, that's a probably a good starting point there. And there could be a business that um, has maybe a couple of those sure. issues. Oh, sure. Maybe or all, all five. five. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So walk me through it. Um, I hire you, right? Sure. Uh, and by the way, have you worked with any law firms? Uh, we usually don't. I, I and, don't blame and, you. And here's why. We're a pain in the butt. Well, 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 that and you know, it's interesting. It's I, I think that there's a challenge there. You've got a lot of so we involve we get involved a lot with organizations that have multiple owners, right? Whether a family business or a practice such as a law firm or mm -hmm. asset management firm. The challenge there is in the EOS world. Ownership doesn't necessarily equal leadership, right? And that's hard for a lot of organizations to, you know, to swallow. If I'm an owner and I'm not a leader, but what we find is that dysfunction in these companies actually exists because we mix and match those ownership leadership yeah. hats. Yeah, and so that's a really hard thing to come to terms with in a right in a partnership style business. So, uh, let's say you did work with law firms, sure, and I came to you and said. Help me diagnose the reasons why I'm not growing as fast as I want to grow mm -hmm. and what the issues are in my organization. Walk me through what I'm going to see as... I'm trying to get some free advice here. <laughs> Maybe. Let's um, do this. <laughs> walk me through what I'm going to see um, as your process for helping me. Yeah. So 
We're pretty straightforward. What we do is we do something called a mini EOS workshop. It's it's about 90 minutes we spend with you and your leadership team. And it's just really an opportunity for you to kind of take a deep dive into EOS. Is that right for you? And am I the right person to help you through that process? At the end of that, if you guys say, hey, let's move forward with this, usually what it takes is about three days over the course of 60 to get that leadership team clearly aligned around the foundational tools of EOS and implement those as well as clarify their vision. And from there, we work with our clients once a quarter and for an an annual once a year for two days back to back just to help them come up for air every 90 days. Mm -hmm. How do we do? What do we need to focus on next quarter? Let's solve some big issues and go out and execute for for another quarter. And so most of our clients we're working with about 10 days over the course of two years. Uh, some stay longer because they like the third-party facilitation yeah. and the accountability that comes with it. But we work in a pretty unique way. We don't require any of our clients to sign contracts. Basically, at the end of the day, if you loved what happened, great, pay us. If you didn't, you don't owe us a dime. You have no obligation to continue to work with us. Is that? Oh, is anyone too small? Uh, we can get too small. We say 10 to 250 employees, but... I will say there's outliers on both sides of that. You know, I've work, I'm working with a couple startups right now that are just two-person teams, but mm-hmm. um, they've got some big visions for the, that organization. So, um, yeah, you can be too small. It's um, it, it's an amazing amount of confidence that you have in your abilities that you're going to stake your time um, on whether your clients feel and see results. Yeah. Right? How long would you... That that's that's unusual uh, in a consultant. Yeah, I actually think that's one of the reasons why we're why we're growing as fast as we are. I think it's you know we're kind of the anti consultants out there. We're not yeah. trying to be a leech. We're trying to create independence as fast as possible. You know, our growth model is you telling ten other companies they'd be yeah. crazy not to work yeah. with us. Um, but it it also kind of gives me peace of mind that hey, we got to earn our keep every time we're in that room, right? That's fantastic. Um, I would like to note something for the fans that are listening that Ron is drinking a dewy coffee from the popcorn shop. We'll be tagging the popcorn shop in this Um, episode. (laughs) We were thinking of changing the name of this podcast to uh, ADD with Molly and Alex. (laughs) Uh, And this is why. Um. So, um, okay. So you've explained what I, as a, as a client of yours would see mm-hmm. and when, and how I would pay for it, which is great. Uh, any success stories that come to mind? No. <laughs> no. Molly is in rare form today, no. Ron. You're, this is. She's you're, reading my mind. Oh my well, goodness. Well, I told you we're so, so family. So brother. And sure. Sister. Yeah, we've had a lot of success stories. I um, One of our clients won the Weatherhead 100 last year, mm-hmm. like won the thing. Uh, I think we had three in the Why top 12. Because you did. Because I'm in the weather. I, oh, we just I got know. it. Oh, right. We just got it. Yeah, we did just you? got it. Congratulations. Congrats. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. That's great. We've had a, um, I just had a client uh, hit their 10-year target in four and a half years. Mm. So uh, average wow. growth rate right now is sitting around 22% for my clients. Um now I'm sure our economy's helping with that, yeah. but um, Get a for that to be the a- for that to be the average, that's yeah, that's great. Twenty two percent, they're doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah. wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, wh- do you find it difficult? Have you had any difficulty with clients adopting your system because they were so set in their ways? Sure. And what do you do about it? You know, uh, one one client in particular fought tooth and nail the entire process because they could do it better, stronger, faster. Yeah. Um, and now they're our biggest advocate because uh, they say, just listen, just listen around as opposed to fight them. But the, the, I think your skeptics in your business are actually your biggest asset because when you win over a skeptic on a team, everybody takes note. And uh, I think we shy away from them and we don't start change in organizations mainly because of skeptics. But if leveraged correctly, they're the ones that help us get to that tipping point in an organization where we can positively affect culture. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever advise 
your clients on staffing issues where, for example, the client may be on the fence about whether they've got a good team to begin with? Sure. You know, we we help. We obviously don't make any recommendations, but what we do help them do is hold up the mirror and say, hey, is this right person for your organization? Are they living your core values? Are they cut from the same cloth um, as you? And are they in the right seat? You know, hmm. do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have capacity to do that job well? And people are only going to have two types of people issues. You know, we're going to have wrong people. They're not cut from the same core values, but they may be a real high performer for us. So they're a cancer to that organization. Or they're in the wrong seat. They are right people. They live our core values. Right. They just don't have what it takes to operate this seat on the accountability chart. So maybe there's another another option yeah. in that organization. So you just bring up some things that maybe make them think themselves and come up with, de- like you were saying, you don't sure. make the decisions, but you certainly um, provoke the conversation within them sure. to take a look at you know their business and see who they want to right. move and or get rid yeah. of. Yeah, no one's coming to us because everything is unicorns and rainbows, True. right? They've got True. some issues or else they wouldn't be seeking some help. So right. Everything's unicorns and rainbows at, at my <laughs> office. So that's right. That's why I'm not seeking you. <laughs> <laughs> or at least we see rainbows. And <laughs> um, I think that there is always a point in time, you've probably seen this, where the founder realizes that they are their own company's mm. liability, bottleneck, worst enemy, whatever yep. you want to call it. And um, I definitely reached that point. And it's such an emotional decision. Mm-hmm. It almost requires something catastrophic to happen mm-hmm. or something, you know, just uh, um, unexpected or, or something terrible because you the the narrative unless you're that rare leader that just is humble from day one yeah. right and knows how to check their ego at the door from day one and that is, that i think is a rare leader um most of us do have a narrative that we come to work with which sounds something like well i know i must be doing something right because Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And I mean, so I've had this firm for six years now and it in many ways has exceeded all of my expectations years ago. And I if you if you in fact, if you would have told me that I would have I'd be hitting the numbers that I'm hitting now. um, If you would have told me that a couple of years ago, I would have said, you know, maybe 20 years from now, but not in two, three years. Um, And when you reach success in some parts of your business, that feeds that narrative. I must be doing something right. But then when you see the problems that you are causing or at least not fixing, Mm -hmm. um, that's a different narrative, but it requires that first narrative to step aside. It requires you to really have that humility and the ability to check your ego. And that's something that I think off and you tell me if 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 this is your experience too ron it often requires something to knock your ego mm-hmm. off right you know you know Big time. is that is that your experience sure i mean that's that's life. that's how i came to eos right i mean i I'm the crazy visionary with 20 ideas before breakfast and 19 of them we shouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole right but Right. I thought because I own the business, I'm also the right one to run that business. Yeah. And until I realized that's not my unique ability, my unique ability is the ideas, be the face, be the voice right. of the business, but don't run the day-to-day operations, delegate that to someone who has that unique ability to do that. Right. Um, until I kind of let go that of that vine, did I not, you know, our growth has been incredible since I've let go of that. But that's your baby, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I probably work with a dozen family businesses right now where we're trying to hand the business off to the next generation. And these people live and breathe this business still and know that they have to let go. Right. Um, and what we find is this structure and this 
space we kind of create for those teams and those owners in large part allows them to let go even though it's a really emotional thing to do right you know we've seen tons of tears in that room uh anger you know happiness tears of joy is it something that you know you were saying you went through it is is it something that people have to like quitting smoking you gotta Mm. want to quit smoking yeah, this, this it, is not something you... You're not pushing it on. They have to do it in their, their time. Yeah. It, you've got to be committed to this. You can't be interested in it. And usually people are coming to us because they've tried it on their own. They This isn't their first rodeo. They've tried to delegate or let go before, and it hasn't worked. Mm-hmm. Um, and they know that there's an issue. They might not be able to put their finger on it, but they know there's an issue. Um, and we just kind of create the space for them to, to work through that with the leadership team yeah so well and 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 this isn't this is getting back to traction this is a system that has been um employed across the country thousands mm-hmm. of business twelve thousand businesses is that what it is something like that yeah we have about six thousand companies running eos right now with with an implementer okay. and we've got about probably 10 times that about 50 60 thousand okay using eos tools yeah either on their own or yeah and it's interesting because one of the things that we talk about in coach with those guys is i've read the book you need an implementer <laughs> you know um and they constantly talk about how much farther they get because yeah. it takes so much time and focus yeah um how much farther they get when they get an implementer involved yeah i'd say over half of our client base has tried to self-implement right and has ended up asking for some help yeah um, and I think it's actually not a bad thing because it helps them realize what kind of a commitment this really takes right. for this to work. Yeah. And I was thinking too, I mean, I would imagine that one of the values or one of the things that you bring to the table is, um, focusing the leadership's attention four times a year, mm-hmm. getting them into a room and saying, okay, for the next day, you're not working. You're not right. going to be practicing law. You're not going to be practicing dentistry or whatever it is. You are just going to be talking about vision mm-hmm. and talking about your processes and your culture, right? I mean, just, yeah, we want you working on your business, right. not in it for a day, a, a quarter, right? right? Yeah. Together, collectively, yeah, uh, with some help to stay focused on that. And if you, th- you know, we're built as an organization or as a society just to stay shallow mm-hmm. and to to jump from task to task to task. And if all we're doing is firefighting, you yeah. know, no, no one's moving into that fire prevention mode right. and thinking longer term as an organization. So we just want to create that space. Yeah. Good. Good stuff. Um, the, I, I did want to ask you um, in terms of one of the things that is on your website is highly effective meetings, <laughs> right? Um, I I have some tools that I use to make my meetings highly effective. And Are they? I think they're pretty effective. I, I don't know about highly. Should we bring in the team? Um, I think they would they would agree that yeah. we have pretty effective meetings here. How do you yeah. help teams have highly effective meetings? What do you need a at question. a What do you need at a meeting to make it highly effective? Well, um, first, I think start on time, end on time. Mm. Every time, like we treat it as sacred in our business mm. and, uh, and we, you know, we practice what we preach. We eat our own dog food. Um, so we don't ask our clients to do something we're not doing. So we start on time and on time, the meeting's sacred. You can miss it for two reasons, like vacation or death, and it better be yours. And we want to honor you while you're on vacation. So when you're there, you're present. We meet for 90 minutes a week and, uh, that concept of public accountability, did you do what you said you were going to do last week, has got to be present. The concept of people being engaged in solving your most important issues, not just a reporting kind of environment. where, And we're not getting stuck in these discussion loops. We actually need to make decisions on things. So that whole concept of, you know, the roads of the world are paved with squirrels that couldn't decide, like how do we get people off of 
this discussion, merry-go-round around their most important issues, stop kicking the can and solve some stuff. Um, and then at the end of these meetings, we actually rate the meeting. Everyone in the meeting's got to rate it, scale of one to ten. And if it wasn't a nine or a ten from you from an effectiveness standpoint, why you got to give a reason why. Right. And so I love that. The, that you know, if that meeting was sucked for you and it's a four, then it's a four, right? You were on the phone the whole time. You were late. You didn't do anything you said you were going to do last week. We didn't stay focused on our most important stuff. That was a waste of time. Ron notices that I've been on my phone a lot. That's, that's why he said that. You know that, right? Um, it's research. Uh -huh. It's research. I am. Um, on your also... Oh, this I don't know if this is on your website or if this is a speaker topic or maybe it is both, but process-driven business, right? So yeah. your quote earlier about working on your business instead of in your sure. business, Michael Gerber, right? The mm. E-Myth Revisited or whatever. I love that quote. Yeah. I love it. I think that every business... Uh, who, uh, which does not have the senior leadership step away to just think about working on the business. And in fact, probably more than just four times a year, like mm -hmm. as often as possible, sure. stop working in your business and just work yeah. on your business. Process has always been a challenge for me. Super sexy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the um, trap that I fall into consistently is... I think I know what makes for a good policy or a mm -hmm. good process. One is make it collaborative, mm -hmm. right? Don't just kind of set, say, this is our new process. Now go follow it, right? right? Get people's feedback, get some buy-in. And in fact, I've always felt that if you can get the people, uh, some of them to actually write their own processes, mm -hmm. that'd be great. They'll have some emotional resonance. They'll have some investment. Um, but invariably... Um, we all go back to working in the business or maybe we're still working on the business, but on different parts of the business and sure. it sits on the shelf. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you, what, what, what's a good way to have the processes once created actually sink in? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is recognizing that process is actually sexy. I mean, what's sexier in a business than everyone doing something like the right way, the best way. And so that concept, a lot of people look at process and think, you know, that's painful. And yeah. I don't want to spend time doing that. Yeah. Um, it's all in my head. Yeah. Well, like it's not what's bringing the business in. Right. right. That's not scalable. Right. We're not scalable though when this stuff is sitting in our heads. So right. we take a really entrepreneurial approach. We say, listen, we don't want to create a hundred page SOP manual on here's how we execute uh, a right. certain process in the business. Right. We just want to document the 20% of your process that yields 80% of your results. And you can humanize all the exceptions in there. So there's a lot of room for autonomy for people. Yeah. Especially if you have right people in the right seats. But I've seen a lot of companies go on these documentation sprees and then the process still doesn't get followed. Right. So... We use a methodology called FBA or followed by all. And so that concept of anyone that touches a step of this process gets trained on it. We measure on the right scorecard to make sure it's it's being used. And we hold people accountable to that. So when it's not being used, the expectation isn't that 100% of your people use 100% of your processes 100% of the time. The expectation is that it's the exception, not the rule when it's not being used. And we're immediately trying to solve the real issue as to why that's happening. Yeah. Either, hey, we didn't train on it or we didn't make it clear enough or the process isn't working. And so we need to create a, an environment in the organization for people to be open and honest to say, yeah, this is too cumbersome. It's too complex. Right. Let's simplify this thing. So it's one thing to go document everything. It's a whole other thing to be intentional about getting that followed by all. And quite honestly... If you guys as leaders in your organization are exempt from following the process because those don't sure. apply to me, the owner, right? Then we're teaching everyone what we really value in the yeah. business. And so we got to lead from the front right. from that perspective. Um, agreed. Yeah. Other than the, um, the training with specific businesses, you also talked about being a, a speaker. Mm -hmm. Are these... Um, be a Buffalo, which obviously 
is my favorite. I don't even know what that means, but I love it. Um, <laughs> highly effective meetings. So these might be things that you would go to a group of people. It has not. It, it, you're not. They have not hired you to do this entire sure. process. Yep. This is just maybe a topic you recover at a lunch or you know where I'm going sure. with this, obviously, because yeah. since that's my job and that's what I do is book all these <laughs> speakers. Um, so you do yeah. that as well as... We do, yeah. Okay, hire and, a uh, So that Be a Buffalo one is actually... Yes. That's, um, that's actually our... The Buffalo is our mascot. And it's actually our first core values to be a buffalo. So uh, the story goes that buffaloes on the Great Plains as a herd would charge into storms knowing that they're going to see blue skies faster. And cows as a herd would essentially run from the weather, essentially guaranteeing they're going to spend more time in pain. And so that concept of charging into your storms as an individual company, department, whatever that is, uh, we think we know how to help companies do that. And so that whole concept of stop kicking the can down the road on your most important issues and let's solve some stuff here mm -hmm. um, resonates with people. I totally agree. And in fact, I got um, so excited about Ron being here that I had a tattoo of a buffalo put it right on my arm. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, nice. Nice. I totally nice. believe that is yes, awesome. I had a buffalo, but it's not an appropriate place to <laughs> show it. Um, you got engaged. Congratulations. I did. Thank yes. you. Yes. Um, do we have a date yet? Uh, June 22nd. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. That's awesome, Ron. Thank you. Nice. Yep. Congratulations. I'm excited. Um, Ron, that's, that's the first step. Yeah. You donated your property for firefighting training, firefighter, oh. firefighting training. Yeah. My neighbors loved that. Yeah. Tell us more about that. <laughs> yeah. So, so where do you live now? You're in Bay I, village. I live in Bay village. Okay. And I, I live on a, a yeah. street called Bayview and, um, yeah, so I we, we ended up buying the property across the street from us because we love the street, but we just outgrew the house. You're we trying to merge two families in this uh, uh, in this relationship. So, oh, you're going to be a Brady Bunch family. Too? We are. Oh, yeah. So what will be two, your total? We'll th we'll have three total. Okay. Yeah. Oh, how two fun. fourteen year olds and a twelve year old. You have so. twins. No, no, she one. has a fourteen-year-old daughter. I have a fourteen-year-old son. Okay. And I have a twelve-year-old okay. daughter. Yeah. Oh, how fun. Yeah, it's lots of hormones floating oh, around that yeah, house. Yeah, I know it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. The, so we bought the house across the street to do a tear down and to build a new house. And uh, before they tore it down, I donated it to the fire department, and huh. they used it for a good month. Wow. Doing drills and smoking the house and. How cool is that? Dragging out these dummies. Oh, <laughs> I mean, my it was, gosh. It yeah, I'm very, sure your neighbors were super pleased. They were pleased. super excited to see <laughs> fire trucks out there for a month. Yeah. Did, you, wow. did you did you clear it with them first at all or run no, it past not them? not really. Are they paying some <laughs> yeah. of the taxes? In retrospect. <laughs> right. Yeah, no. Um, oh, that's so cool, though. I never even knew that you could, uh, could I donate my house and then they could rebuild a new one? Does that work that way? No. No? It doesn't work that all way. Right. Okay. But but do you get a any kind of tax credit for it? You know, I thought I did, oh. but unless they burn it to the ground, that's not the case. And they don't burn them anymore because of the EPA. So there's all kinds of uh, – they got to do so much prep work that they don't burn them anymore. So they just use them for search and rescue and all like that Like knock stuff. down doors. Yeah, and, cut holes in floors. Yeah. And okay, collapses. can we talk about this point? On the day you resigned from your job, yes. your then-wife – says that she's pregnant with your first child <laughs> yes holy shit right is what you said I'm yeah sure. in fact if that didn't happen I, I probably don't succeed as a business okay um so yeah that was uh f almost 15 years ago well, at least you had a reason to make sure that this, sure this next step was a good one right wow right wow yeah that'll... did she know you were resigning she did okay yeah okay. but we didn't know uh we were pregnant until right. after oh. the fact. <laughs> wow. A few That's hours a after, after the fact. That's a good motivator. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you are a meditator, true. Or true. False. Yeah. yeah. I, I talk about that. What's your practice? Well, uh, so my fiance is a, uh, just finished her yoga certification. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a little room off of the uh, master bedroom. And so 
Um, I use my Headspace app mm -hmm. and I do a little, uh, you know. Can't do it. Kumbaya. Can't, I, I, get, can't do it. You can do it. it, it I can uh, So I think I wouldn't do it without the app. I don't think I'm disciplined enough to do that. But um, I she's spent an entire drive to Maryland. All right. Seven hours that I was alone by myself and just could not get into my head alone. I mean, there are just a million other things going on. I think most I, people. I even said, just I turned the radio off. I'm like, I'm just going to yeah. stop thinking and see what comes to me. And no. You're not supposed to stop thinking. You're supposed yeah. to just notice what, what comes up. Tons of, everything right, comes up. Right. But it's amazing. I think, I think. Um, I, I'm, I meditate, I try to meditate every day and I, I was using the Headspace app for a while. Okay. Um, and, uh, I, yeah, I, P Puttycomb, is that his name? The, the Australian guy? Yeah. Um, his voice is so th soothing. Yeah. Oh my, it just makes you, it feels yeah. like a hug. It does. <laughs> I'd need like, maybe Kevin Love could do it for me. They or probably have, uh. I could change the voice yeah. to a <laughs> per no, but, Patrick Dempsey maybe. Could. But it, 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 it's, um, it's amazing how much you learn about yourself and what your brain does when you're not, uh, forcing it to do mm. stuff. Um, just by listening and, and noticing the thoughts and, and, and trying not to follow the thoughts. Right. Um, so, uh, so you, tr I see, but the thing of it is Molly, I think you could do it, um, in small bursts and, and with headspace, I think it was 10 minutes for 10 days yeah. initially. Right. It's only 10 minutes. And you then I couldn't even, you I was so busy it. today. I couldn't tie my shoes. Look, <laughs> I put you them on and I just realized I never tied them. That's. <laughs> I don't have 10 minutes to get to know myself, for God's sake. Uh, how long have you been meditating? Uh, it's been a few years now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you... I see a bromance starting. I love it. <laughs> I, I, I say all the time, it was a total game changer for me. It is. You know? In what way? Like, what What way did it change your life? Um, I will answer that question. Uh, did you find? Did you, did you Did you find it to be a game changer for you? I did, you okay, know. I, so you I, go first. So I don't know how to describe it, but I feel like I can almost see the stressful times of my life from the outside, as opposed to being in it anymore. Yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, but. yeah. Um, this. Um, do you know Tara Brock at all? She talks I about don't. that concept as. Uh, she, uh, she's a meditation instructor. She wrote a great book called Radical Acceptance, which I recommend to mm. everyone. Um, but she talks about this idea of um, uh, living your life either above the line or below the line. And mm. below the line, it, above the line is where you are able to see what you're doing before you do it and uh, see why you're doing the things yeah. that you're doing and see what motivates you. And being below the line is when you're just doing it, Yep. right? Unconsciously. You're just, you're just living, you're just going. And so and that, is that bad to be that way? Well, there's, I mean, that's part of meditation is there's nothing good or bad. There's, it's all non-judgmental, right? There's no good or bad. There's just it. You're, right. you're just, the game changer for me was being, I, th I think is kind of what you just said is, is being able to go above the line and not associate with my thoughts and my emotions, my anger, my frustration, my stress, whatever, mm -hmm. and and instead like separate yourself from those emotions and well, why see do them. You want to? That's that's what I don't understand. Well, for why what, would you want to? Like that is your life. You're living it. Why would for? Yeah, it's for one thing. For me, what was really valuable is that it allowed me to be less reactive. Right. So my kids, for example, or, you know, a, a, a judge in court or a, a, a client mm -hmm. would easily be able to trigger me into doing or saying something. Where, whereas after practicing meditation for a really long, I don't know, not a, probably a couple months, I was able to like create that space and create mm -hmm. a pause where I wouldn't react right away. That was one thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And move on. And the other thing is it's really helped me. <laughs> I'm bored already. And here's why, here's why I think you could really benefit from it. It's really helped me with attention and focus. Gotcha. 
<laughs> gotcha. You um, want to medicate me? You want me to put 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 me on? Uh, I love my brain. I love my ADD. Self diagnose. <laughs> um, I love me just the way me is. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Um, I'm gonna change my brain. That's where all my great no, ideas come from. No, you're not gonna from. change your brain at all. You're gonna learn it about it more, and and see what it's doing. Mm. Anywho, um, <laughs> I think it's time for the lightning round. Oh, oh my oh, gosh. I oh, have new I'm questions. Scared. I'm so excited. See, I so this came out of my stuff an hour drive. <laughs> my new question. Fantastic. Were so I listened to driving? my brain. <laughs> I listened to my brain. Yeah. All right. Well, Molly, why don't and you And this go is first? a picture of um, DC because I accidentally took a wrong turn to Maryland and voila there was Washington DC <laughs> look at that nice yeah job. yeah thank you thank you all right so Ron uh, what are you binging That's on an old TV question. right now yeah oh we just finished uh, Ozark oh I love you're, Ozark, you're Ozark. Uh, do you love it yes I'm also feeling like I wouldn't know what to do if I came into some cash. <laughs> like you want to launder Still. some money? <laughs> oh, my. Wait, did you just finish season two? Yes. Yeah. What would you like better, season one or season two? Season two. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I might have to For re... Sure. So I, I think I just kind of lost it in like the third or fourth episode, and I just couldn't get yeah. through yeah. it. Yeah. Um, if you, have you watched the Fargo? Uh, I scene? haven't. If you like Ozark, you'll love Fargo. Okay. The, the, not just the movie. Good. I was looking about, for something yeah, else. You'll you'll well, love it. You'll love shout it. out to Jacques from Flow Vodka because he had suggested Yellowstone with Kevin Costner. Mm. Okay, it's on Paramount, which used to be Spike. It's on regular cable. It was phenomenal, and I it. want to move to Montana. Yeah, so it all took place in Montana. Interesting. You meditate gorgeous. out there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now I could be a buffalo out there. Yeah. Um, so it was a great, great, if you're looking for a binge, I highly suggest Yellowstone. Okay. Um, uh, a perfect day for you is. Oh, I like that one, Molly. Thank you. You're going to like it. Uh, I love the water. So mm. we've got a little, uh, beach access there at the end of our street. So starting the morning off on a paddleboard out on the water. Mm. A little, I mean, who doesn't like brunch with the fam? Right. So... Um, brunch with the fam and uh, yeah we're probably going out to a nice dinner and, uh, and no kids in the evening nice yeah nice we know what that means <laughs> Alex inappropriate what's a, what's a perfect day for you Molly um you know what I'd have to meditate on that <laughs> I don't know I don't know all right a movie a good dinner and a movie Popcorn, my family, having all my family with me. Yeah, what about you? Um, a perfect day for me, and we're, we're saying perfect, right? Not just good or yeah. cool. I'd be in New York City. Too. A perfect day for me would involve some skydiving, mm -hmm. uh, <sighs> other speed sports, uh, hanging out with my kids and my girlfriend, mm -hmm. uh, and um, some sort of world travel. So all of this would happen in like Rome. That's a big day. Oh, that's a big see, day. That's a perfect day. That's You're a big thinking day. way bigger than I was. Well, she said perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You did say That'd perfect. Be... I didn't listen. And here I just went to the movies. Um, if I wasn't a... EOS implementer. Yeah. yeah. Life coach. Not life coach. Um, <laughs> no, no. No, not life, not life coach. coach. Um, if I wasn't the founder of Culture Shock, yeah. what would I be? I think I'm some coach. I, I, I think I'm, I love working with kids. I mm -hmm. think I'm coaching football or wrestling okay. or something along those lines. Okay. Um, just watching kids do things they didn't think were possible. That's pretty awesome. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And my last one is... Hang on, Molly. If oh. you, if you oh. weren't an executive director, what would you be? Executive director of the Chagrin Valley Chamber. Um, I'd be a morning show host. I have my own Interesting. show. Interesting. It's oh, coming. I could see I'm that. just not there now. But okay. It, yeah. What would you be? Uh, a best-selling author. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last one is one song I hope I never hear again. <laughs> Now it's going to be like burnt into my brain. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a suggestion. 
What about that? Uh, remember that Friday song? Yes. Yes. I can't even sing it. We don't want to, no. but that was a catchy one. Oh. Yes, agreed. I think mine would be that um, the, uh, oh, he was from Hong Kong, I think. Or, and there was a dance oh, to it. Oh, Korean? Yeah, and there was oh, a dance yeah, yeah. to Korean. it. Uh, Gangnam Style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never hear that. It's going to be a good day. <laughs> Alex, you got one that comes um, out to your head? Gosh, I'll think. Of, I'll think of one in a minute. Aren't those good, Alex? Are you proud of me? Well, the problem with that last, I liked all of them, but that I could have gone one, so many genres on that. Yeah, yeah. don't make me. No, those are no, mine. No, I'm just saying. The, the thing about that last one is <laughs> now care. I'm thinking of the Friday song. Uh, you know? Well, actually, I'm thinking of it's Friday night, but that's not yeah. the one you're no, talking about. I, no. But I know it's one, one you're talking about. But I, I, I do think that this is a massive upgrade to your other questions. Thank you. Yeah, nicely, <laughs> Thank nicely, you. nicely done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, see? Yeah, well done. Thank you. Um, okay. Especially since I could never remember my other ones. <laughs> Keep bringing that piece oh, of paper. I, I'm going to put it right in the drawer. Yeah. Ron, you're on a desert island. Yes. Shipwrecked for a minimum of three months. Devastated. Three months. Could Missing be there, your family. You might be there the rest of your life. You might be there for another week. You have no idea. But you yeah. know it's somewhere between three months and forever. You may bring with you any single author's entire bibliography who is the author hmm. i think it's malcolm gladwell good choice yeah solid choice Outliers, yeah. tipping point really keeps your uh keep you thinking there yeah. on that island i mean you got to be prepared for when you get off yeah you know think big yeah nice big long clarity break yeah do you listen to uh his uh revisionist history podcast I don't. I've been doing a lot of Tim Ferriss lately. Yeah, but, yeah. But, Tim uh, Ferriss is awesome. Yeah, yeah. That revisionist history. It's it's like a book every yeah, I'll week. Check that you out. You know, it's like the the same style and the same, you know, stories. Yeah. Um, it's amazing actually how much how, how deep he drills into these stories and yeah. still churns them out every week. Um, Malcolm Gladwell is amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, same shipwreck. Same desert island. It's a bad ship, man. I know. I know. It was I supposed to be a three-hour tour. <laughs> uh, same am amount of unknown periods of time. You may bring with you any single musician's entire Ooh. discography. Who is the oh, musician? Man. We just saw Elton John in concert, mm. but I would say um, I got to go with... Uh, Rolling Stones. Interesting. Good choice. Yeah. Lots, lots of uh, there's a there's a big discography there. Lots of songs. There is. There. I think I, I was thinking Variety. By the time we, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm there for yeah. that long, mm -hmm. right? What about you? Uh, my book, cho my author choice is Kurt Vonnegut, mm -hmm. and uh, my uh, my music choice would probably be Fish or The Grateful Dead be a toss-up it's a lot to listen to here i don't read no I, ch I changed that it'd be bob dylan oh no i think i said the bible you did say the bible um and i don't know who i said for music was it billy joel it was definitely not billy joel was it the beatles well i mean we're not going to go through 800 things to <laughs> no i, th but I don't I, remember I think I can... who it was how are you going to remember <laughs> you're right um the next lightning round question is giving myself time to remember <laughs> what it is uh oh it's the one what is an embarrassing thing about yourself that no one else knows oh that is the exact so, reaction we get well, 100 i love it here's what it. that tells me here's what that, that tells I have me one. nobody listens to our podcast until the end i'm cool with that <laughs> <laughs> That's what it tells or, or the, me because the, the, it's the same question every right. week. So I don't know why people are shocked. You know, our um, Pam Turos, our last guest, she had listened to a number of them. She came prepared. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah. So um, I grew up totally petrified of like public speaking, petrified. Yeah. To the point where I would throw up, make myself <gasps> sick, not go to school. I mean, all of those things. I ruined two plays in grade school. Like I was, oh my I was totally petrified. But 
I was mild, I'm mildly dyslexic. And so all the speaking when you're growing up is reading in front of other people. So when you can't do that fast in front of people, then you're just petrified. So right. it wasn't until college and I could actually start speaking on things I was passionate about and having a conversation with people did I realize that, you know, hmm. that was kind of... How funny. Almost a unique ability, but I was terrified of it. Hmm. Huh. That's the most common um, fear among Americans, but yeah. not, not so in other cultures, but Americans really? fear public. They, they fear it above death and snakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's huh. something about, they say, you, that's primal about you standing in front of people with all these eyes looking yeah. at you, almost like you're in like the Sierra yeah. or, or the, you know, the... The jungles and all these eyes right. looking at you. I very am obsessed vulnerable. with doing that. Like I love, I don't think about it. I don't, yeah. I love talking in public. Yeah, it doesn't bother me anymore. Now, yeah. But That's I'll tell funny you, that you went was, into that. I was petrified. That's funny. Yeah. Um, so I skipped one. What is the routine or practice that you do consistently that you've gotten the most mileage from? Uh, I think it's the journaling. I think mm. I. Oh, bromance! Did we talk about that. <laughs> we we have a lot in common. Yeah. Uh huh. When I, when I don't do it, I don't have a focused day. Mm -hmm. Like when I can't start the day off writing so a few things down. So you start it off. Yes. And always. you end it. I do both. Yeah. Oh. I I do. I I I journal in the morning and just before I go to bed. Do you see? That's much more disciplined than I am. I wish I had the discipline to do it at night. Am too. I going to make your journal today? Yeah, actually, I think you will. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> uh, well, when you journal, is it open-ended or is it like a series of questions that you ask yourself or both? Well, I heard a speaker a while ago talk about, hey, when you journal, this could actually be something you leave for your kids. Like, So don't write about the bad crap. Like Everyone has to. But write about what you're grateful for and what went well and like the things that you're working on or thinking about. Um, and so I try to do that intentionally because yeah. I do want to be able to look back and be appreciative of those things. Hmm. But it's also to think about like the forward facing stuff. I need, you know, it's just if I'm putting pen to paper, I'm solving something or something's yeah. working. Because, you know, I, I don't know who, I think it was Peterson said, you know, you only really work things out if you're talking them through with someone right. or writing something down. Mm -hmm. So I think in general, I'm trying to solve some stuff that, yeah. that's going on in life or business. But I, I also kind of want to let the kids know, like once right. they're old enough to care that hey, this is kind of what dad did. Blah, yeah. Blah, blah. Can I, can I comment on that for a mm -hmm. moment? No. So, um, I would do a couple things for you to consider. Um, and, and these have been really meaningful to me. Yeah. So number Mullers. one is, um, I would definitely create a set. What, do you journal on paper or in, on paper? Co okay. Mm -hmm. So I would get a second journal that you don't want your kids to see or don't plan for them to see. So you could write down all the bad shit too. Cause mm -hmm. that, there's a lot of value in mm -hmm. writing and, and just complete free, free flowing stream of consciousness that includes, you know, your, your stresses and your concerns, your worries, your fears. Right. Yeah. And in fact, um, I'm sure you've, you've experienced this. Maybe, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but like going back and looking at the things that would used to scare the shit out of me, mm -hmm. the things that I was so, um, stressed out about that I was paralyzed with fear about them. And then looking back and going, man, none of that happened. Yeah. That is really informative. Yeah, I could see a lot of and right. powerful. I would That's think. That's going to yeah. be the more interesting book too when you're done, right? Right. So then yeah. the other thing I was going to say is um, put in a few questions in there, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think you already are by like telling yourself to record things that you're grateful for. Mm -hmm. That's one of my questions, right? Mm -hmm. But then at the end of the day, I've got two or three questions, and it doesn't take more than a couple minutes. One of them is 
um, what's a problem you're trying to solve. Hmm. And there, I've, I've talked about this on, on prior podcasts. There's a lot of science, and this is definitely true anecdotally for me, um, to support the idea that you prime your subconscious before you go to sleep. Yes. So you put down, you write down a problem you're trying to solve and just write it down and then let it go and go to sleep. Hmm. And you're, I swear your subconscious works on that problem. You wake up. So let me ask both of you, where mm. are you when you, and you have both have kids, yeah. like where are you when you're journaling? Like, are you in bed? Are you in the bathroom? Are you at the kitchen table? What do you require uh, your surroundings to be to journal? Yeah, I'm in my home office or in my office before people get in. You know, so I think that I agree with this whole sleeping on it thing mm -hmm. because uh, I do something called clarity breaks. And so I do those every other Thursday for two hours, like 5.30 a.m., 7.30 a.m. In the morning? Yeah. Oof. But I'll do that in my space because I, I've got a whiteboard. I, I like to stand and whiteboard yeah. stuff. But I al I already decide what my next clarity break is going to be on for two weeks from now. Because when you mm, do that, interesting, you're What's already trying to break? solve it. The it's just I'm trying to solve something either in the business or build out an idea or something's going on in personal life. Like you know, what do the kids need? How yeah. do I better show up for them? But if I decide what that's going to be two weeks down the road, subconsciously I'm already trying to solve yes. it before I even get to the clarity break yeah as opposed to just showing up and starting to think about yeah. something so. yeah when are you doing your journaling so i do everything on this uh microsoft surface machine right here and i use this um thing called evernote mm -hmm. and i have a five minute journal that is a morning journal and an evening journal and then i have just a journal that's just free flowing stream of consciousness whatever comes to mind and i I never miss a day and I'm doing those wherever. I mean, like the evening journal, usually I'll read Maya a story and then wait for her to go to sleep and then I'll journal. And and that mm. the, the prompts at the end of the day are so important. So one of them is what's a problem you're trying to solve. One is um, what's a lesson you learned today. Mm. Um, I mean, I bought that journal book that, and then I don't even know where it is now. I think I cracked it. I don't know. You had said that there were there's kind of like already preformed. Oh, the five minute journal. That's the Correct. that's yeah. the yeah. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 and you I bought, bought it. it. You know, yeah. you don't I don't use know it. where it is. <laughs> we got to use it. But, <laughs> I don't know where it yeah. is anymore. But that's actually. Uh, I mean, because I lose things all the time, I um, can't have paper journals. <laughs> right. So you're. I need everything. Yeah. Yeah. Encrypted <laughs> and um, you know yeah. in the cloud and Evernote. Um, don't want and then those the, and, out. and and then the morning prompts are equally important, right? Because they start with things that you're grateful for, and then there's like some affirmations in there, and then you're you're. Um, you know, if you only got three things done today, what mm. would they, what should they be? And then I also have a prompt in there to look at my weekly journal, right? The 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 weekly planner for your week because okay. I'm not going to remember what my goals for the week were. Yeah. So I have to tell myself in the morning, look at this is where you look at your weekly planner, you know. And then and God then only after that do you put your three crucial results in. I for didn't the day. even open yeah, my to do list today. Name. It's it's OCD, honestly. Yeah. 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 And, and it's also a recognition that my brain will do its own thing if I'm not if I don't focus it on prompts, you know. Anywho. Yeah. Good for you, um, Alex. Kurtzberg. The last question is the oh, Christie. So Christy is um, a stripper. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we he don't does know. Listen to our podcast. It's possible. <laughs> she certainly um, she she dresses really well. Yeah, she um, could have been a stripper back in her day. She looks good. Yeah. Uh, Christy publishes a really good magazine called Neighbors, and I which we are in at, this episode. At, Yes. Or this this, yes. this current so shout edition. out to her. Maybe yeah. we could Christy say that George. right now. Christy George, we uh, she did a great article in Neighbors yeah. magazine about, about the us. podcast. So yeah. thank you so much. Shout out the phone's ringing off the hook. Right. Uh, so we gave Christy an honorary lightning round question, yeah. and, oh. it's, and it's called the Christy. Okay. All right. Great. So you ready for the Christy? Let's do it. Uh, if you could interview. Any person in history, living or dead, who would it be? Hmm. Uh, you know, I I lived for a while down in uh, 
Charlottesville, Virginia in high school for a few years and I became obsessed with Thomas Jefferson. Ooh, and what yeah. he, you know, built UVA and yeah. um, Monticello, Monticello, whatever yeah. you refer to that as. I literally toured that about a dozen times as a high school kid on my own because mm. I wanted to hear every different uh, tour guide. Yeah. Um, I find him fascinating. Yeah. And actually, if you look at his tombstone, you know, he was president of the United States, but he actually ordered on his tombstone what was most valuable to him. It wasn't the precedence. He was f- founding of University of Virginia. Hmm. So I just find it fascinating, this whole thing with, um, you know, the, the slaves and, like, how that all worked. I, it was just – yeah. I, I became a big history buff down there. I had a great history teacher in high school, yeah. so – he, the the uh, the Jefferson Memorial. Jake and I were just there. the The quotes that they chose for his memorial are mesmerizing. Yeah, they're so prophetic. Yeah, um, yeah. He was a he was a really um, there's a he he was a really like shrewd negotiator too, mm-hmm. right? Like a really um, good politician and diplomat and yeah, yeah, really a, a interesting dude. I agree. Oh. Oh. All right, our lightning round is officially. Done. <laughs> and seen. And seen. Uh, so, Ron, what do you got in the hopper? What do you got coming up? Well, um, I don't know if you guys saw it. We just had, uh, um, we had, when the Browns fired all their coaches, we put out a press release saying, we will help the Cleveland Browns <laughs> free of charge with your culture issues. Um, and actually, Channel 3 picked it up. So, yeah. Dave Chodowski picked it up, came out and did a story. And, um, so we've been getting a few phone calls around that stuff. That's awesome. I think I more got banned from that stadium <laughs> than actually got it invited Please. to come and help. They need people to but, come. They're not getting rid of anybody. Um, <laughs> Trust so me. So I, I don't think that's coming anytime soon. We're going to be doing some work with the Bowler School of Business over at uh, mm-hmm. JCU. Um, and we're just we're loving working with the small to mid-sized businesses here in, in uh, Northeast Ohio. I you know there's a hotbed hotbed of entrepreneurship in mm-hmm. this area and uh, not a lot of people know that that's what you know uh, our backbone is and so w- we built out this traction leadership center in Westlake over by Crocker Park and that's really where you know our our acronym for that is TLC that's really where our leadership teams are coming for a little TLC because you know you can get beat down at the end of a quarter if you don't yeah. come up for air. And so uh, we might be open to one of those on the east side as well. Where so, where can people learn about that and about Culture Shock? Yeah, just cultureshock.com. Without that's with the, the K. S- without the K, yeah. yeah. Um, that's probably the best place to go. We're on Facebook and uh, Twitter as well. I'm sure we can get you those. But awesome. I'm a low fact finder, so I don't have those. <laughs> On me. Oh, I've got them all right here. I got your LinkedIn. I, I got bet we your... have the exact same numbers. You <laughs> Probably do. Yeah. Molly, what are you working on? So, um, proud and excited to announce that my countertop time dropped today. Did you watch it at all? Congratulations. No, I've, I've been. I've been um, so, That's... it's my little show. Since no one's going to give me my own show, I'm just going to create my own show myself. Nice. Um, and I brought my high school freshman. Winter formal date was my first guest. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Pictures and all. Yes. He actually owns a wine um, tasting room in downtown Willoughby now. So we tasted wine. and Was John there when this happened? He was not, but his wife was there. The, the feelings are over. <laughs> the feelings are over. <laughs> um, but a shout out to Eddie. He was great. Um, and we'll you know, make sure everybody likes Countertop Time on Facebook. Um, and they'll come out every Monday just for your, just for your enjoyment, just for, I'm just sitting 30 minutes with somebody shooting the shit okay. as, as what I say. And, um, so yeah, hopefully maybe someday Alex will join me. Ron, you're always invited. You. It's at my house. Yeah. Um, because I spent so much of my countertop that I'd like to show it off. <laughs> uh, and you're welcome to join me, Alex. Thanks Molly. So, um, yeah, so that is uh, that's what's happening. Where do people find Which Countertop is, Time? Um, they can go to Countertop Time on Facebook and like it there. Okay. Yes. Interesting. We have a website coming, but that's uh, Facebook Countertop Time, or I have a YouTube channel Countertop Time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and you, Alex Gertzberg? Well, I'm very excited because Cover My Six now has a startup version. So, Ron, Cover mm-hmm. My Six uh, is a service that we have at our law firm that audits small and mid-sized businesses in the six areas most likely to get them sued. Oh, right? nice. Customer relations, vendor relations, employees, uh, shareholders, um, technology, and insurance. Right? Very cool. So... 18 years of practicing law, all the litig- almost all the litigation that I've ever been involved in, which is hundreds of cases, have right. fallen into one or more of those six categories. So businesses can um, use us and do use us to audit themselves in those six areas, and we help them stay so out of court. So startup So the one? startup version, because there isn't a lot to audit there, small companies don't yeah. have so a lot. Startup meaning the business is a startup. Yeah. So what you. we do now with startups. Sounds like there's a good collaboration right mm. here. Yeah, is, mm. um, is we give them a custom binder of all the legal documents that they're going to need in those six areas. And they have um, a lot of really good lawyer-proofed provisions um, that help them wow. stay out of trouble. Uh, employee handbooks, customer agreements, shareholder agreements, things like that. So yeah, that's the Cover My Six startup package. Every time you go to say Cover My Six, I always think Cover My Ass. That's what, that's that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Then it's working. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, Because that's what it does. That's its point. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go to CoverMySix.com, you'll see the new startup package there. I'm pretty excited about it. Love it. And does that come with you as well? Or yeah, so it's know, all I mean, custom made. So you there there are lawyers, there are litigators who prepare it just for your business, mm. and um, yeah, you have uh, a good amount of face time with lawyers to answer your questions and then to help you guide uh, each other in creating and then implementing these documents. Love it. Very cool. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and of course, if you want to follow the best podcast ever, um, you can find us on Stitcher, Spotify, Spotify. Um, iTunes, best, the, the best podcast ever dot com, right. um, Facebook, iTunes. Leave us a review on iTunes, folks. Really yes. important. Do us a favor. Do Ron a favor. Yes. Do us a solid. Do us a solid. <laughs> Leave us a review on iTunes. That's really important. Is it? It is important. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and send us feedback and tell your friends. Yes. This was great, Ron. This yes, was thank great. you very much for having us. This was awesome. I really appreciate you've that. Done a, you've done a... Um, Quite a few podcasts. How did we rank? Are we? Are we? Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, okay. I love the. I love the. Uh, the banter. The banter. How back much we and hate forth. each other? Yes, you can tell. <laughs> you guys are brother or sister. In here. We, we are. Do bro- say that. Yeah. We that do say that. We do say that. That's awesome. Uh, my, really. I, I'm the Catholic version, and and, and the, Alex is the Jewish version. I'm the smarter, better looking sibling. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the kinder and wiser, but that is it's true. okay. Um, uh, okay, well that's good. We stack yeah. up with the rest because he's oh, got yes, quite yeah. a resume of I podcasts. Know. So I, I was very nervous about that. Those are all From my A game. Those are all the second best podcast ever. Correct. Correct. We yes. are the best yes. podcast yes. ever. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Ron, thank Ron, you very thank much. You. Alex, have a great day. You too, Molly. Awesome. See you guys next time. See ya. Chris Zierke, how are you? Great, Alex. Thanks for having me today. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Chris, you are the newest uh, addition to the Gertzberg Law Firm family, correct? That is correct. You've been with us now for what? Like four a, weeks. Four weeks. Four glorious weeks. Four good weeks for you, Chris, so far? Fantastic weeks. Yeah? Yes. Uh, do you like working here? It is a great place to work. And the really? staff is fantastic. The lawyers wow. are great. But even hear. better, listen, we give great service, right? And that's important at the end of the day. Agreed. Good. Good, good, good. Chris, uh, tell the kids listening at home what it is you do. So I am a franchise attorney, and that can have lots of different meanings. But what I really focus on, at least currently, is franchisee transactions. I happen to be a franchisee myself for for a period of 10 years. Uh, So I have been through those battles. I have been through those 
issues and transactions, uh, and I really have a passion for the franchisee. You um, had a couple of Jimmy John's franchises, yes? I did. I At one point, I had five Jimmy John's franchises. I had a couple of Moe's franchises, and I also was a Soccer Shots franchisee. Yeah. Wow. What do you think is the unique perspective that you have on um, counseling businesses uh, relative to lawyers who have only ever worn the one hat as outside counsel? So I think when I counsel franchisees, more than anything else, I can see the entire picture, right? Start to finish. When you when you start a franchise or when you become a franchisee, your sole focus is getting open, right? Whatever that is, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a, a service operation, right? But there's so much that goes into it beyond just that initial phase. Uh, and uh and it is so important to really understand how you're going to operate your franchise and really what also is your exit strategy. That cannot be put off. Uh, in addition, and for, for myself, right, I had, some, some, an, I had another owner. Uh, and that just adds another level of complexity because at the end of the day, uh, your family is also owning this along with you. We don't operate businesses in a vacuum, right? And I know at least at Gersberg, right, we pride ourselves in knowing our, our client's business. Uh, and especially in the franchise world, I really do understand the business uh, risk and, and the business, you know, the pressures that we yeah. face as franchisees, right? Because there's that w- unique relationship with a franchisor. And a lot of franchisors are really, really great. Sometimes they're not. And, and how do you handle all that stuff? I haven't. So let's talk about franchises. Um, at a really elementary level, um, at a high level, Chris, who should buy one? Who should think about buying one? Right. So the obvious answer is, well, do you really want to own your own business? Or as some of my friends have done in the past, do they just want to be an investor in the business? Uh, and, and, if you're, and when you're considering the franchise model, it's really important to make sure you understand what you want to do. Uh, because there's even an item 15 in the franchise disclosure document that states whether you actually have to be the main operator of the business or not. Um, but in addition, um, you know, it's do you want to un- operate under structure? So if you want to be a franchisee, is do you want to be operate under structure? Where you, by the way, where you have some marketing support, you have operational support, you have some brand power, right? You have all of these great things in place, uh, but are you willing to take direction from the franchisor? Uh, and that's a really important trade-off, right? Franchises in general have a higher success rate uh, than non-franchise businesses. Right. But the trade-off is, is at the end, uh, you probably will not reap the return that you would if you're taking the risk of starting your non your own non-franchise business. Right, right. So um, I think of it, I really like the way you you... You described it. Um, it. It's it's a it's a question of whether you want to um, hitch your 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 horse to something that is pretty tried and true, right? Usually the franchisor has been in business for a while. They've got a system set up. Um, you're buying into that. You're paying for that, but you're um, reducing your risk. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and, and so for Jimmy John's, right, I love food. I had worked in restaurants in, in high school, and I kind of always wanted to do that. But at the end of the day, I am not a chef. I have no mm. creative abilities to do that. And so for me, it was a relatively easy decision. It was, I need some concept out there that is tried and true. And so for me, it was then picking the right one. Right. Uh, but the franchise decision for me was relatively easy. Yeah. And then once you've made the decision to buy a franchise – um, am I saying that right? Is it buy into a franchise or is it buy? Oh, a I think buying a franchise is buying fine. a franchise, right? Um, what is uh, what's what's an important diligence task or or some important diligence tasks that a potential franchisee should be looking at when deciding which one to go with or whether to go with one at all? Right. So the first thing I would say, and it's really obvious, right? So it's kind of funny that I'm even mentioning it, but let's make sure you find a franchise that fits your passion. Mm. And maybe that sounds easier said than done. There are a lot of great tools out there to help you with that. There are a lot of great franchise consultants that help you with that, and they put you through a series of, of tests, and a lot of them are free, by the way. Uh, and so can really check that out. Uh, you know, I think Jeff Bezos said it best. He says, um, one huge mistake, people try to fit passions into things, but at the end of the day, your passions really find you. And so really spend some time with that because if you buy into a franchise system and then realize, oh, I don't really like this, yeah. well, you're committed, right? It's a, it's a bit of a marriage. And so really spend some time doing that, at least especially in the beginning part. So that was one diligence right. item. What's another one? T- to me, this is one of the most important. 
Uh, and listen, there's a lot of things that, that a franchisee needs to do uh, in terms of their due diligence, but it's talking to other franchise owners in the system. Uh, and it's always a little challenging, right? Because you don't want to come in and, and the most and the thing you really want to know is what are your sales, right? Because at the end of the day, that's where everything start, starts and ends, right? It's, if they're not making, if their revenue is not great, I'm not sure anything else really matters. But that's really the one question that franchise owners don't want to disclose, especially right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you really need to start getting into questions about, hey, how, what's your experience like with a franchisor? And that, by the way, is so important, right? Because at the end of the day, the first couple of years when you're in a franchise system, it's kind of a little bit, a bit, little bit like a honeymoon, right? You're, everything's kind of hunky-dory with the franchisors. It's, it's, it's how are things in years four, five, and six when when you really kind of uh, understand the franchise system and have a little bit more of a mastery to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that relationship, obviously you don't know that in the beginning, but right. other franchise systems or other franchise owners do know that. And so really start talking about that. A lot of franchise owners, especially if you're opening a restaurant or something with, with, with some type of lease premises, really get into the build-out cost. Is it really kind of what you had budget or what you anticipated? Right. Talk about employment issues. Any, in, I mean, at the end of the day, once you're open, right, your employment practices and your HR issues uh, can consume you. And that, by the way, does you no good. When you get yeah. into that, I'm talking about time and energy and effort for, away from your business. Uh, you know, that's right. a big drainer. So really delve into those issues as well. Uh, and then maybe at the end, you can start talking a little bit more numbers in terms of sales. Uh, but again, you have to play that by ear. How important is it to learn from the franchisee what their relationship with the franchisor has been? Well, I think that's extremely important. Uh, all franchisors are not the same in terms of how much control they ultimately wield. Some are a little more hands-off, right? So they all have operations. They all have operational support. But how do they really interact with you as the franchisee? Right. And that is so important uh, to, to understand because if, if you don't understand that, especially for a franchisor that might be more hands-on, you will, I don't want to say you'll be miserable, but life can be a little frustrating, as, especially right. as you head into the back end of that franchise agreement. Um, I'm a huge checklist guy. I think you are too. I am. Right? Um, and I always counsel people to go into any meeting where they're trying to get some benefit, some value uh, from the conversation with the other person. Go in there with two things. One, what are the top three things that you want to glean from that meeting or re- top three results you want to get out of it? And then second, a full checklist of questions, right? Um, and the, that checklist, when you go into that franchisee, that, that meeting with other franchisees, um, is something that you want to put a lot of thought into. And I'm guessing, Chris, if anybody wanted to help build a checklist like that, they can contact you. Absolutely. And obviously the checklist is going to be different depending on the franchise system. Right. But absolutely, that is so important to have checklists yeah. to make sure you don't miss anything. Yeah. Because uh, um, what you don't want to do really, right, is a day later call back again. Right. Uh, right. And say, hey, I forgot topics A and B. Right. right. And sequentially, that meeting with the uh, with your potentially new fellow franchisee, where is that in the process? You, First, you decide you want to you want to delve into the franchise world, right? And then you start working generally with a consultant, or you do it on your own, and, and you pick kind of what concepts you might be interested in, and then you narrow it down to to really what you like best, right? So for me, it was initially it was Jimmy John's. So you kind of pick that out. You reach out to, to the franchisor. You have those conversations. At some point, uh, and there's sometimes there's pre-screening done. Obviously, the franchisor also does not want to waste time on a, on a franchisee that just doesn't meet their their system. But once you get the f- franchise disclosure document, then you ha- that's to me when you really do your due diligence. Uh, there, there's a 14-day period where you can't even sign the franchise agreement anyway, right? And that's where you really spend some time uh, talking to other franchisees. They most franchisors will normally give help or help you talk to other franchisees. Uh, it's good to use that list if you can on your own reach out to other ones as well. That would right. I strongly recommend that as well. Uh, and, and again, really focus on your, if you can really focus on the franchises in your market, other states have different markets and some concepts are better in certain markets than others as well. Um, but after, once you get, but once you get the franchise disclosure document to me at that point is really when you should at least reach out to your franchise attorney and say, Hey, this is where I'm at. So step one, you're thinking about doing it. Step two is you, um, uh, reach out to some potential franchisors or intermediaries. Step three, um, you talk to the franchisor, you make sure it's a good fit, 
they send you a franchise agreement, a franchise disclosure well, document. Which has the franchise agreement as an exhibit to that, right? but yes. And then there is a, a minimum of 14 days of diligence that you would perform. Right. It's at that point that, among other things, you're talking to other franchisees. And that's at the very latest when you would want to be talking to a franchise lawyer like yourself. Um, so, so the closing with the franchisor is the signing of the franchise agreement. After that, either before or I guess presumably after that, that's when you're a business owner. Now you're doing all the things that a business owner would do. Correct. Including potential training that the franchisor right. requires and all of that stuff. Right. Correct. And we're going to get into those, some of the legal issues uh, surrounding... Some of the common transactions yeah. that all franchisees go yep. through. In right. our next talk. Correct. Chris, this has been good. I appreciate it. Thanks for the help. Folks, if you want to learn more about Chris, about his franchise practice, uh, and about the Gertzberg Law Firm, you want to go to gertzberglaw.com. You'll find Chris there under the uh, professionals section, and there should be a link at the top uh, to Chris's website right. for franchise uh, for franchise law, and that'll be in the, in the ribbon at the top of the uh, gertzberglaw.com website. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Alex, thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye.